Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So are you all, are you all uh, awake and engaged? Uh, what's happened to the, this, little, this little thing I need? Yes. Uh, so this is, this is some, uh, you're all doing PhDs, right? So one thing you're going to do, need to do in your PhD is write research papers. And that's what this talk is about. This is about the process of getting, to get, get, getting your act together to write research papers that will be accepted by program committees. And it's kind of, uh, it's like this. It's, it's, it's just a skill, right? It's a really important skill. Uh, doing the research is important, but writing about it is also really important. And so I just want to do, in this next hour, just give you some, some thoughts about the process that I go through when I, when I write a paper. This is not something about which anybody has a monopoly on truth. And um, so, uh, as I go, just, just um, ask questions or make comments, right? Because you'll have had an experience that's different to me. And just stick your hand up and, um, and make, ask a question or make comment as we go along. Don't wait until the end, because we'll almost certainly run out of time. We'll have too, way too much fun, right? So uh, just, um, uh, uh, just remember, this isn't, this isn't something that anybody has perfect answers to. So, uh, let's see. I want to start off with some non-reasons for writing papers. But when you write a research paper, you have to know what you're trying to achieve. Right, so here's, a not, here's something that most people think is, might be about writing papers. I think it's a very bad reason. Right? You can, you, the, all these slides will be up. You can read the, the cartoon later. Right? So it's not just to sort of impress other people. It's because writing research papers is part of being a good researcher. It's a fundamental part. Right? And I'll say a bit, a bit more about why. Um, here's another thing that people often write papers about. They think, oh, I've done this work, and I should write about it. So it's like what I did in my summer holidays. Right? But the trouble is that nobody is really interested in you per se at all. Right? You are, but they aren't. Right? Why are they going to read your paper? Not because they want to know about what you did in your summer holidays, but because you're going to con convey something interesting to them. Here's another thing people often write papers about. They've built some system and they say, of course, everybody would want to know about the WizWaz system, but sadly, this is not true. Nobody else is interested in the WizWaz system. Right? They, they, it's yours, and why, why should they care? Um, last thing, and this is slightly more plausible, that you might think you're writing a research paper to describe something new, right? Novelty is, you know, is kind of usually good in science, isn't it? And you might find, you read papers, you say the novel feature of the system is X, right? So now we have to pause a little bit, right? Because in biology, say, novelty has value in its own right. If you discover something new about the way cells work, the world is a better place, right? We know more. In computer science, it's like a fractal subject. It's like a snowflake. Every place you work, the subject expands ahead of you. Why? Because we, we kind of make it up as we go along. It's purely a, a sort of invention of our own minds. It's a bit more like mathematics. So the fact that you have explored a very, very minute corner of the snowflake, and it's brand new, is not really inherently interesting to other people. Does that make sense? Right? So if, it, if novelty, in, just is not, in its own right, is not useful, what is? You have to have some element of utility, right? You want to convey through your paper a reusable idea that will be of some use to your audience. So I do recommend to you this paper by Fred Brooks called The Computer Scientist, This Toolsmith. He's the guy who wrote The Mythical Man Month. And uh, that's his most famous book. But he also gave this Alan Newell lecture. If you just type this title into um, Google or Bing, you'll find it very quickly. Um, and the first part of the paper is really interesting because it's, um, it, uh, uh, it, it's almost poetic, actually. He's, he's an interesting computer scientist. He writes in very nice style. Um, and he says, by, in design, uh, read computer science, in contrast with science, novelty in itself has no merit. If we recognize our artifacts, that is, things we build as tools, then we test them by their utility and costs, not by their novelty. Does that make sense? This is really important because when somebody reads your paper, they are not going to be looking just for novelty. Consciously or unconsciously, they're going to be looking for utility. Fred goes on to say, if we perceive our role aright, we see more clearly the proper criterion for success. A toolmaker succeeds as the users of his tool succeeds. Right? Succeeds. So you're giving something that's going to be useful to them. Uh, I like this. However shining the blade, however jeweled the hilt, however wonderful the WizWaz system, its merit is tested by its utility in cutting, that's right, its usefulness to its users. That's a good, good piece of, um, what's the word, uh, uh, a sort of sanity check when you read your paper. Now, 
So go back to this thing about an idea, right? The fundamental thing I think you're trying to do in a research paper is to take one idea and to transfer it from your head to, what, what's your name? Dennis. To transfer it from my head into Dennis's head. So it's like, it's like a virus. I'm trying to infect his wetware with a new virus that is the idea that's in my head, right? Because it's going to be so persuasive, so exciting, so interesting that Dennis will be unable to think of anything else for the rest of the day, right? <laughs> and then he'll tell his friends and soon it'll be all over the planet. That's how to have impact, right? So I put Mozart on the screen because he's my quintessential example of somebody who did this really well. Hundreds of years after Mozart died, we are replaying his, his memes, right, his ideas. We actually go to concert halls to hear people read his papers. Well, they, they play it, right? And, and of course, the, the act of performance is important as well. But it is rather remarkable. If people are going to hear readings of my papers in 400 years' time, they're, they're not going to be doing that. But look to Mozart, right? He's the man. Um, so, um, uh, and the, the converse is also true. Right? If you have a fantastic idea, but you tell nobody, The, what would have happened if Mozart had sort of just sat in a dark room and not told anybody about his amazing music, right? We wouldn't have been able to enjoy it. If you keep your brilliant ideas to yourself and you don't tell anybody, you might as well have not had them. That's a bit sobering, isn't it? Right? So, in other words, communication is part of the process of doing science. It's not a kind of thing you do at the end. It's part of the very fabric of the work that we do together as human beings. All right? Yeah. But there are excellent artifacts uh, in the field by scientists uh, or inventors. Yeah. We don't have any like manual describing it or any papers about it. Which Good. Are hidden or Give an example. The perfect, uh, some perfect churches or mosques, um, which their architect didn't publish anything about it or. Uh, uh, give an example. Forces, like uh, we have like uh, planes from. Uh, uh, U.S. Air Force, and uh, we don't have any papers about them published. So a plane from the U.S. Air Force mm -hmm. is actually, so, so uh, it, it, it's kind of inside a wall of secrecy. And on the whole, that's probably not a good thing for science. It might be a good thing for the U.S., right? <laughs> um, and I'm sure that information about that airplane is shared within the U.S. military, right? But otherwise, if the guy who built it was run over by a bus, no more airplane, right? So I think, I think military security is a slightly special case. But supposing somebody be, I don't know, an iPhone or something, right? If, 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 if it was purely a, a, you know, one person's invention they produce and that nobody knows anything about it, somehow it will be lost to mankind. The, and as scientists, I think, the, the sort of commercial imperatives do indeed, commercial or military imperatives, do, do somehow put walls around this, right? But as scientists, I think our goal is to sort of get our ideas as widely shared as possible so that they have their influence on, and make the world a better place, right? So, so that's our goal, if you like, I would say. Yes? I like the comment on the fractal idea. I, I like it very much, but uh, I slightly wonder if, um, you know, if the idea by itself doesn't have a meaning, even if there is no direct utility to that. Because we don't know if the fractal doesn't have holes, and you know, if the snowflake is not blue. You mean we might not have utility yet, but it might turn out to be useful later, something like that. So that is true, right? And the world, the, the things full of particularly brilliant mathematicians who've done work that seem to be very obscure and specialized to begin with that turned out to, you know, hold the, uh, the meaning, you know, quantum mechanics is based in some part, some part on group theory, right? But, but uh, as a PhD student, you cannot rely on doing that, sure. right? You that can't rely on being, can so it can happen. It can happen, but my suggestion to you is that you focus on, you tr try to focus on things that do have some, I mean, the utility might not be, you know, useful to every housewife. It might be a proof technique that is useful to somebody doing semantics and programming languages, right? So, but useful for something, right? Okay. You could just be an amazing genius who's going to do work that's only recognized in 50 years' time, but it's a high-risk strategy. <laughs> All right, let's just, let's, let's, uh, Let's go, go on. So do, do keep making, asking questions, making comments. It's good. It's much more fun for me. But, so, idea, idea. In a paper, try to write a paper about a single idea, right? If you have 10 ideas, write 10 papers. Do not write one paper with 10 ideas squished down to a form in which nobody can understand them, right? Having more ideas is good. But try to say, if you read a paper, do this whenever you read a paper. What is the idea that's in this paper? When you write a paper, think, what is the idea I'm trying to convey? If you don't have a clear idea of what a, that, that idea is, your readers will not either. Right? So it's a, it's a good sanity check, I think. 
Um, sometimes you may not know exactly what it is to begin with, but by the time you're done, you must, I think. Um, and uh, so uh, one way to do this, actually, is to write a sentence in your paper somewhere that says, the main idea of this paper is, right? And then you're, thought, then you're forced to think, oh, oh, how do I finish this sentence? So just try putting that at the beginning of section three or something. Yes? Quite often you have papers with many contributions, so they, they have a couple of small contributions. Can you say that one idea, but many contributions? Well, so I, I want to talk a bit more about, more about contributions in a second, but I, would, uh, I think it is possible to write good papers that have sort of many smaller ideas somehow, but it's harder to do it well. So, and everything I say today, I should have said this to begin with, I'm going to, as it were, caricature the situation, and I'm going to make sort of strong, unequivocal statements that, of course, are not really true about every paper, or even every good paper. But they're just the direction in which I have found most profitable to. So, so of course, you can disobey every suggestion I make and still write a great paper. Um, uh, but, but, yeah, I've, I've, so I think the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the sense of trying to identify an idea, if you can, is really good. And if you can't, you may say, it's still the paper I want to write. Go for it. Uh, right. One thing about process, too, before we get on to content. Here is the research plan that most people follow. They uh, have an idea, they do some research, and then they write the paper. That seems logical, right? A uh, good scientific way of doing things. Completely wrong. Here's what you should do. Have the idea, write the paper, do the research. Right? So what you do is you have, a, you have an idea, and you start writing a paper about it. You probably do a little bit of preliminary work. And as you start to write the paper, you discover that, oh, you know, you can't write section three because you haven't done that proof or you haven't built that system. There's a, there's a, it, you use the paper as a kind of forcing function to tell you what you need to study next. The world is full of people who spent a year sort of hoofing around in some kind of space, uh, generally doing stuff. And then they've got to two weeks before the conference deadline, they start writing the paper and they discover there's some major piece that is important for the paper but is not done. Right? So use the paper as a forcing function. Another way in which it's a very good forcing function is that as you write the paper, it will become clearer to you what you do not understand. As you write the paper, it will become clearer to you what you don't yet understand. This happens to me all the time. I start to write the paper, and it sort of forces me to crystallize in actual words the idea that I've been kind of vaguely thinking about. I thought I understood it, but when it actually comes to nailing down the details, uh, I can't quite say it. Or it just seems to get complicated. I have to keep putting in qualifications or caveats, right? So just uh, writing is a really good way of finding out whether you know what you're talking about. Yes? How many papers are you currently working on? Oh, um... Well, so, so, so I, I collaborate furiously with lots of people, right? So for ICFP, the, con, the, 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 well, the Haskell Symposium, which I last submitted to, I was involved in four different submissions, right? But that's because it's a major conference that's in my area, and I was collaborating with four different groups of people, all of whom wanted to write a paper. I wouldn't do four single-authored papers, one, probably just one, yeah. So that's a, that's a little unusual, but um, depends how much you collaborate. Um, and uh, I'm, I wasn't the primary author on any of those, right? So if you're the, you can't really be the primary author on more than one paper at a time, mm -hmm. right in one moment. Okay, now, uh, I want to go just say a little bit about this idea thing that you start with, right? So, again, so one, one fallacy is you've got to do all the work and then write the paper. Don't do that. Just use the paper as a forcing function. The second thing is that you must have a good idea, right? You think, ah. Oh, Everyone else seems to have good ideas. I read their papers. Their ideas are amazing. And I, I am a mere worm. I only have measly, weedy little ideas that nobody would want to hear about. Right? Everybody feels like this. Everybody feels like this. Right? So you, 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 you do not need to have a particularly wonderful idea to write a paper. You, in fact, any time you have an idea, no matter how pitiful, you should start to write a paper about it. Now, it may be that it turns out to be pitiful, in which case you just stick it on your web page and it's kind of an unpublished report. Or what is much more common is it turns out that things weren't quite as simple as you first thought. You start with an idea that seems simple and it ramifies a bit in kind of interesting ways and it turns into something. Right? That's a very, very common, almost universal. Quite common is to start with an idea that seems pretty simple and it ramifies into something you think, oh, darn, this is way too complicated. You know, I thought it was simple, but no, it's not. I've got to find a way to make it simpler, because I can't, otherwise I can't write a paper about it. So the, the, the very important thing I want you to get from this slide is 
Do not think that you have to have a good, important, interesting, impactful, world-changing idea. Be perfectly content with a small, weedy, insignificant, unimportant idea. Are you with me? Even if it turns out to be that way, the exercise of writing your little paper will have made you a better person and be, be, be better able to write that exciting, important, impactful paper. M mostly, impact and you know, a sense of importance in the larger scheme of things is something you only discover later. You don't discover it at the beginning. Right? Um, and in fact, uh, sometimes the act of writing is what makes the idea flourish and come into bloom. It's like a seed. And the, the writing the paper is what... what is the, the, the water that brings it into being. So if you wait, you think, oh, it's too weedy, right? Then you're not watering it. So it stays weedy, right? All right. Um, and this is almost universal in my experience. Right. Okay, so enough about uh, sort of uh, getting started. But the very most important thing is to start writing uh, and not to wait until you have something, something brilliant. Start writing early, very early. So far, so good? All right. Now, I want to say a bit about uh, the content of the paper and the con con sort of content and structure, because there are some things that I found work and others that I found don't work at all. Uh, so, first thing to do is to just sort of set the scene for the narrative flow of the paper. And what you want to do is to get your reader hooked. Remember that readers uh, don't, uh, are sort of time poor. Uh, people, so they're, they're not going to read your paper with close attention from beginning to end. You want to get them hooked early, so you want to say, uh, here is a problem, and it's an interesting problem. So in the first few paragraphs, they think, ah, oh, if I could solve that problem, I'd be happy. And then you say a little bit about your solution, and you say, oh, that's kind of, in a, if you like, you present your idea in outline, say, oh, that's interesting, that's quite ingenious. I wish I knew more about how that worked. Or oh, maybe I'll turn the page and read on a bit more. And then you give them the, the payload and the details, right? And you do some comparison with what other people have done. That's your sort of narrative flow. Sort of hook them by um, uh, incrementally. You don't want to start with a big pile of boring stuff that might seem scholarly but gets in the way of getting your readers addicted to the idea that's in your head, right? You remember the virus thing you're trying to convey. So here's... Um, my uh, sort of uh, expectation for readership, right? So lots of people will read the title. Um, uh, rather pe fewer people will read the abstract and the first page. When I say introduction, I really mean first page. So when you're looking through a conference proceedings or even a journal, you might look at, you start to read a paper and you think, oh, oh, maybe, but then you move on, right? It's not a big deal for you. It's a big deal for the author. If you're the author, you care about those people, right? But mostly they, they're not very committed to you. They're just going to move on. So you want to hook them on the first page. So where are you going to invest your effort? Well, you want to spend a significant effort on that beginning stuff. Um, and I'm going to say a little bit about most of these sections. So, firstly, just about the abstract, right? This bit at the beginning. Uh, oh, drat. Oh, dear. Oh, there it comes. I'm drat. It's got a little thing. Yes, abstract, this first bit. Uh, people often invest quite a lot of effort in abstracts, and I think it's not worth investing very much. In fact, I usually keep abstracts quite short. Here is my little recipe for abstract, which I got from a guy called Kent Beck. Four sentences. Only four sentences. Don't write a long abstract and then repeat it all in the introduction, right? That's a pain to read. Instead, write four sentences. State the problem. Say why it's an interesting problem. Say what your solution achieves. You don't have space in the abstract to say what your solution is. And say what follows from your solution. So here's an example, for, uh, an incestuous example taken from this talk. What's the, um, state the problem. Number one, first sentence. Many papers are badly written, hard to understand, right? Uh, what was the second thing? Why is it an interesting problem? Oh, it's a pity because their good ideas may go unappreciated. So it's an interesting problem to solve this paper, paper thing. Um, well, say, say what your solution achieves. Well, uh, following simple guidelines dramatically improves the quality of your papers. Uh, and then, uh, what was it? State what follows. Um, your work will be used more and blah, blah, blah. Right? You get the idea? Four sentences. Keep it brief. That's my advice. And I would write the abstract at the end. When you're all done with the paper, you know, write a four-sentence abstract. Don't, don't lavish too much care and attention on it to begin with, because it'll probably change as the focus of your paper changes. So much for abstracts. Not, not terribly interesting. Yes? A catchy title. Yes, a catchy title is, is worth quite a lot. I don't know how to give advice about how to invent a catchy title. But I think it's worth more than, um, uh, you know, if you write very, very factual titles like, um, you know, uh, uh, an application of structural bifunctors to synthetic epimorphisms in a, um, a, a structured co-monad, then you've limited your readership to pretty... Whereas if you say, you know, uh, mathematics uh, changes the world, or, you know, com computer science theory solves a serious problem, then you're going to make somebody read... Do you see, do you see the difference? 
So that, that's all I can... Uh, yeah. so, so Sorry, title. Simon, do you think it's important to put the right keywords into the title so that oh. it's like uh, in, in search engines, that so it's, it's found it easily? A, yes, so, so something... It, you want to put enough to so that your readers know uh, if, if you're in their area. So some kind of keywords in the title or the abstract. Incidentally, sometimes, not always, sometimes program committee members will choose which papers to bid for in the reviewing process just by looking at the title and the abstract. So you want to kind of have enough keywords in there so that an expert will say, oh, I know about synthetic epimorphisms. You might want to put that in your abstract. Uh, I'll review that paper. Not always. Uh, most, uh, most, um, mostly these days, I find as a reviewer, um, that I, have, I look at the paper when I'm bidding. I'll look at the papers that, the ones that look vaguely interesting from the abstract, I'll then glance at the first page of the paper as well. But that varies, yeah. Do you think attention title is kind of dangerous for reviewers? Because uh, they say, oh, that's a catch title, but you don't do what you are. Oh, well, of course. If you have a catch, you know, uh, you know uh, um, uh, bifunctors change the world, and then it turns out that it's a very specialized, narrow thing, doesn't change the world at all. There's a certain danger with that. And there's also a danger in being too jokey, right? Maybe they'll think you're being too flippant. Uh, it's a balance. I don't, I don't, I don't try I can say anything very useful about how to invent a good title, um, uh, except that uh, you know a little bit of humour can help if you don't overdo it. Now, but more, the introduction is better. I want to focus a bit more attention on, right? Which is what are you going to introduction? This is page one. Try to fit the title, the abstract, and the payload of the introduction on the first page. The physical act of turning a page, you know, even, or even flipping to the next screen if you're reading it online, is a, is a big a hurdle for your readers, right? So you want to say enough on the first page to catch them. So what are you going to say in this introductory section? Sometimes introductions start with, uh, you know, background, sort of vaguely setting the scene for the paper. This is, this is death, right? Because the background is not interesting to your readers. They want to know why they should read your paper now. So here it is. Describe what the problem is, briefly, and then say what your contributions are. So, in describing the problem, uh, use an I would try to use an example. So, rather than describing a problem in an abstract way, give a brief description and then give a concrete example. So, here's a paper that I wrote a little while ago, and you can see that after four lines of text, I've got a program fragment to illustrate a particular example of the problem I was trying to solve. Right, so, that, that kind of gets your... Uh, it's a quick way of getting your readers engage because then they can think oh well if I could solve that problem I'd be happy and I could see that there's something more general hiding behind that does that make sense you're going to say more about the problem later in the introduction you're just trying to uh, sort of give get your audience to have a sense of the problem that you're trying to do an intuition right not a fully formal description of what you're trying to do and so examples are really good for that now um, the other important thing about setting the problem, this is about describing the problem, is uh, not to make it too ambitious. Right? So here's an example. Computer programs, here's a sort of possible first line for your paper. Computer programs have bugs. This is bad. We will solve them. Right? You're looking terribly uh, passive here, but actually, how many, how many papers have you read that play this, uh, that play this kind of game? They describe a problem that, that hundreds of people have spent thousands of man years trying to solve, and you say, that's what my paper's going to do. So it's like describing Mount Everest, right? And, and say that, you know, you read this paper, you'll have conquered Mount Everest. It's almost certainly false. And so it doesn't really convey any information to your readers uh, because it just says, you know, we're working in this general area, basically. They know you're not going to crack this problem. Do you see the difference? Uh, so you want to convey to them something that you can crack. So that's why I say molehills, not mountains. So here's, a, here's an example. You know, consider this particular program, which has an interesting bug, Right? And you get, so you get your readers to think, oh, yeah, I can see the bug. I can see that's not <laughs> totally trivial to spot. In this paper, we'll show an automatic technique for identifying and removing this kind of bug. See what I mean? About, so you want it to be hard enough to be intriguing, but easy enough to be soluble. This is a, a, a classic error for research grant proposals as well that also describe Mount Everest. They say, here is this enormous problem. Give us some money and we'll tackle it and die in the foothills. <laughs> All right, so don't do this. Okay, so uh, two things then, examples and not being overambitious here. Now, uh, the second thing I put here was, one, describe the problem. <coughs> second, say what your contributions are. So I wanted to come back to your questions about contributions here. So I think it is really important to list out pretty explicitly what your paper delivers, right? In a sense, you, what you want to do is to say, if you read this paper, here is the, the payload, the benefit that you will get. Here are the reasons you might want to read this paper. Uh, and then your, uh, your goal is, it's like a sort of menu 
in a restaurant. Your goal is to get your, um, your, your readers to sort of salivate at you and think, mm, I wish I could eat that, right? Uh, so, uh, here's an example. So this is an example for another paper I wrote. Uh, so I had a bit of an introduction to the, the setting and why it was an interesting and important problem. And then I said, uh, in, I didn't say in this paper we make the following contributions, though that's actually a, quite a good phrase to say we make the following contributions. Here I just said we put the choice on a firmer basis. And then I had a list of bullets look, right? One, you know, and I think bullets are helpful in contributions because they forced you to articulate what are my contributions as a list. And they make the reader think, oh, he's making three contributions here. Now, all contributing perhaps to some grand, you know, some grand idea, but nevertheless they're the sort of uh, underpinnings of it. Um, and the other thing about this contribution stuff is to try to be refutable. What's refutable? But I mean, it is possible that you could fail to deliver on this contribution. If you say, we will study the properties of System X, you're not going to fail. Surely, somewhere else in the paper, there will be some information about the properties of System X, right? Whereas if you say, we prove that the system is sound and that type checking is decidable, those are, at least for an expert, understandable and refutable. You know, maybe you didn't prove that it's sound. Maybe you didn't prove that it was decidable. Do you, do you see what I mean? Um, so uh, let's see. You know, we've used it in practice. This is a vague thing. Here, uh, it's, it's, it's at least more concrete. I mean, it, 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 clearly you did build the Wizwell system and implemented a text editor, and you compared it with... You know, these are, these are more... These are, I think... think um, celery rather than overcooked spaghetti, right? Overcooked spaghetti, sort of floppy and, and, and soggy, right? Celery has some crunch to it. You want your contributions to have crunch, all right? Um, all right, and the other thing you can do in contributions is to use forward references. So here, um, uh, uh, what, what, let's see, uh, here in the examples that I've given, I've given examples here in which each claim, right, these are like claims, it's like the specification for a program. For every claim, I give a forward reference, <coughs> right, and over here, what did I say? You know, blah, 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 in sections five and six, this, and contrast them in section seven. So for every time I make a claim, I make a forward reference to the evidence for that claim. Now, how many of you read this stuff in blue in papers? At the end of the introduction, there's this paragraph that says, the rest of this picture is structured as follows. Section two does this, section three does this, section four does this. How many of you read that section with your heart pounding in your chest, thinking, whoa, this is a paragraph that I really want to read because it's going to make my life better? You skip it, don't you? Every time you start that paragraph, you think, I'll just skip it. I'm going to go to the beginning of section two. And these are the words that appear where? On page one, your 100 reader page, right? So you've taken your most precious words and you've devoted them to a purpose which nobody, literally nobody, reads. Why would you do that? It seems to make scholarly sense, but in my view, it's just a waste of space. So instead, use your list of contributions, right? Because then it's not only making, having a sort of narrative flow like this that people actually want to read, it's got some semantic content, but also every time you make a claim, you've got a forward reference to the evidence, and that's so helpful for a reader, right, so they don't have to work out where it's going. And then you can also say, ha, huh, sections 3, 4, and 5 are not mentioned in my list of contributions. Hmm. I wonder if sections 3, 4, and 5 belong in this paper entirely. What would happen if I left them out? You see what I mean? You can sort of do a dead, uh, like a garbage collection on your paper. No references to it, it's out, right? Of course, sometimes you need some background sections, something to set up. So it's not, it's not, a, it's not a short part, but that's the idea. Okay? Uh, let's see. So that's all about introduction. Any questions about this sort of first introductory page stuff? Or comments, indeed? Ah, uh, good question, yeah. So the question is, do you, would you, I said, write the abstract at the end. Um, should you write the introduction at the end, or when you, when you, that is, when you finish the paper, in, end in time, time, time scale, or at the beginning? Actually, here, I would suggest that you at least write the list of contributions up front, right? Because that's the driving force, because you'll find yourself writing when you say, you know, we prove this, that, and the other, section four, right? You're d referring to a section you haven't written yet. So it's kind of like the specification for a program. So in, the, in, in this case, for the contributions, I do think it's a good idea to write. You'll iterate, right? But it's like 
Otherwise, it's like writing an implementation of a program and only then going back and writing the specification. Right? Uh, of course, it's not a waterfall model. Right? You write one version of the contributions, you start to write the paper, you go back to the contributions and change them. There's an iterative, but stop, yeah. Um, then some stuff about the initial setting up you might leave until near the end. But I would have a go at the introduction first. Yeah, anybody else? Yeah. No, I, I wouldn't. I don't have any sense of how many paragraphs I want to write. It depends on the paper. I do try to fit the the this this sequence of the problem and my uh, con the contributions of the paper on page one. That's all. However many paragraphs that takes. Sometimes I have two contributions. Sometimes six. Never twelve. But um, uh, but page one. I wouldn't worry about the paragraphs. Okay. What's next? In many papers, they set it up. Related work. What a disaster. Right? Here is your idea. This is the payload you're trying to get to. This is the virus you're trying to convey into uh, Dennis's mind. And here's Dennis, right? And you put in the way a huge mound, a sort of sandbar of related work. You're going to force him to march through, like a sort of death march, to get to the idea, right? And moreover, the related work at this stage your reader, remember, is not an expert, or may not be a complete expert in this subject. So, and yet, you're faced with this tension of, do you, in this related work section, do you say enough to make it comprehensible, in which case it becomes long, or do you make it compressed and a bit cryptic because your reader lacks the intellectual and terminological scaffolding necessary to understand it, right? So here's a you know, classic bit of um, uh, stuff from a related work section with uh, lots of references and uh, special, um, you know, we, we haven't talked about revocation protocols and uh, transactions. You know, none of this vocabulary is going to be familiar to your readers, or even if it is familiar, they'll wonder whether they mean the same thing as you mean. See the problem? And there's this terrible tension between making it long enough to be understandable, but short enough to fit in a section that's between your reader and your idea. So, the solution actually is very simple, which is don't put the related work section here, right? It just makes your readers feel tired, and worse, it makes them feel stupid, right? Because you've compressed it to make it short enough, and then they read it and they think, I don't understand this, I must be a, a very stupid worm, and this author, you know, he's an incredible genius, I'll just move on, right? I'm never going to understand this paper. That's not the message you want to convey to your readers, you want to make them feel good about themselves, right? So, uh, let's see, what to do. So you, uh, I want to say more about related work later, about where to put it. Right? We're going to put it more towards the end of the paper when you have done your intellectual scaffolding, but instead you're going to describe your problem and your idea making references to related work where it makes sense in that narrative. Yes? Right. So, so here's what I suggest. If you were explaining the problem and your solution to a friend on your whiteboard in your office, you would probably not start with uh, this, right? But you might say uh, the first way you might think of solving this problem would be like this. That's a, that's a sort of the first obvious approach. And indeed, you might then say, you know, these guys five years ago did that. You wouldn't make a big deal about it. Your purpose for introducing that would be as a launch pad to explain your idea, right? So if, uh, the, 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 the criterion I think is this, if it would make sense to explain something, if you were just trying to explain it to a colleague on the whiteboard, then put it in, right? As part of your description of your idea and, and how it works, right? If it doesn't really make sense, if, the, if, it, if it's not on that most direct path, your, your goal is to take your readers by the most direct path to your idea. Of course that requires some background, and every time that background mentions something that somebody else did, you put a citation, right? So you say, yes, expert reader, I know about that, and I'm going to come back to it in more detail later. Don't do much comparison at this stage. Just make admiring remarks about them and give a citation, right? Because at the end you can make comparisons when they've seen the full glory of your idea, all right? So that's the criterion. Use your narrative flow as the driver. Make citations where they naturally come up and don't otherwise. 
Does that, does that make sense? Don't say something just because it's vaguely in the same area. Got it? Yeah. Right. Like, for example, I want to introduce the term natural interaction. Right, uh huh. Then, if I want to do so, then there are different definitions. So, what should so, I do okay. in this case? So, the, qu the question is if I want to define a term like natural, inter inter natural interaction, was your example, and there are several competing definitions, if I was you, I would, I would try to avoid saying definition one, natural interaction, blah. I would say, you know, the purpose of this paper is to improve um, the way that uh, you know, people interact with computers or something, and in particular, so, so uh, we're going to use natural, in, natural interaction in quotes to mean blah, and then give your definition, right? And then you can say, as a footnote or in brackets, there are other definitions, as we shall see in section eight. Um, but I wouldn't stop at that point to say, to give a sort of uh, a survey of the field of definitions of natural interaction, because your readers are fundamentally not interested in that survey. They're interested in what your idea, what you hope they have. Does that make sense? So forward reference to your related work section all the time, but try to keep on your track. Um, Sorry, Simon, yeah. would you apply the same structure to a PhD dissertation as well? Uh, that's actually harder. For a PhD dissertation, I think I, fundamentally, yes. I think even PhD, PhD dissertations are usually come out best with their related work section at the end. But, but this is something you need to talk to your supervisor about and may vary a bit. But with a PhD dissertation, your readers are more motivated somehow. You know, they've, a PhD dissertation is a substantial chunk of work. Your readers know it's substantial. It's got chapters so they can flip past easily. So it's kind of different kind of medium. So I'd, I'd be less, I'm pretty sure about this for uh, a related work section later for papers and slightly more ambivalent about theses. Yeah. Yeah. And for a five pager, where would you compress? Oh, I don't know. How do you how do you write a five page page? Very difficult to write a five page paper, actually. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I'm not I'm not sure I can say anything meaningful right. in answer to that question. So I'll, <laughs> I'll just dodge it. I just it's just tough, and you have to. I, I no. Yeah, my concern with this is even if I agree with you, uh, people often expect to have a related work section. Oh, you should have a related work section. But after the introduction. No, I, I, no, no reviewer has ever come back to me and said you should have had your related work section earlier. Now, of course, maybe they think it's because you know Simon is a great fellow and we shouldn't criticise him, but I doubt it. Reviewers are, are actually pretty, pretty um, uh, brutal. <laughs> I'm sure. So I, I would not worry over much about that. Provide you must have a related work section. It must do a scholarly job. Yeah, sure. But um, I mean, if you refer forward reference to it. In your introduction also, at the end of your contributions, you say, you can also then say, just before you move on, we'll discuss related work in section eight. Yeah. What you want to make sure is that your, re your expert reader knows that you're going to get there, right, and knows how to find it. So, but it can be very brief. That's my advice. Okay. I just want to um, quickly move on to a bit about the, the sort of main payload of the paper, because you're, what you want is you'll present your idea and uh, avoid doing this kind of thing, right? This feels right. But um, it's not what you do on the whiteboard. When you do with your whiteboard, your friend, you do not write out definitions like this. You, you do what? You cut to the chase, right? You say, ah, uh, I'll tell you a bit about you know, the formal definitions later. But what I really want you to do, since you're in my office and you've got five minutes, is to give you an intuitive idea of what the idea is, of what, of what I'm trying to do. That's what you should do in the paper. You need the formal stuff or the more precise stuff later. But the, as a way of introducing the idea, this stuff is not so good, right? So um, uh, the intuition here is primary. The intuition is primary. The intuition is primary. primary. Thank you. Right? Don't forget that, right? If you do this sort of nonsense, people will be impressed by your paper, maybe, but they may not read it. And that, then you failed in the virus infection process, right? Because it's like sort of Ebola, you know, it kills its patients, it kills its victims before it can pass them on, right? You want to keep them alive. Now, um, uh, oh, and the other thing is that even readers who leave you after a bit of the, of the sort of these, these back uh, sort of presenting the idea sections, before they get to the more of the meat, even they will go away with something valuable. So your goal is that every time somebody falls off the bus, they fall off the bus with something useful that they've taken away. They're happy about having read your paper. Um, another uh, thing to avoid is trying to recapitulate 
a sort of personal painful journey. Right? Research is a kind of, it's like walking through a maze in which almost all the passages are dead ends. Right? So you sort of spend, you spend weeks doing this. And then the tendency when you write a paper is to think, ah, oh, I should explain all these dead ends to my readers. And so you carry them painfully through the maze. I, I can't tell you how annoying it is as a reviewer, is you get to, you get to the end of a technical section, section three, and uh, you've been struggling to follow, but you've been putting in the cycles. You think, I'm the reviewer, I should understand this. You get to the end of section three, and they say, well, that turned out to be a bad idea, so in section four, we show a much better plan. You think, oh, give me a break, right? I've only got so many years in my life. <laughs> so don't do this, right? If you don't only explain blind alleys if they are blindingly obvious, meaning sometimes there's something that is the obvious solution and you have to explain why the obvious solution doesn't work in order to explain why your more complicated setup is important. Right? Only then do you want to explain the blind alley. So be very careful. You know, it's, it's, uh, your, your, your blood in all these, these blind alleys is of no great interest to them. All right. <clears throat> so far so good? Uh, of course, what you're going to do on the whiteboard is you will start with an example. The very first thing you do on a whiteboard is always an example, <coughs> isn't it? It's not writing definition, so do that in your paper as well. Uh, I think I have an example of an example here, but I think I'll skip it. But you, I think you've got the message by now. Um, so uh, then the rest of the, once you've got that central intuition over, then the rest of the paper almost writes itself because your business then is to provide evidence to support every claim that you've made in your contributions. Right? So you're going to just provide section after section that, support, that provides evidence in support of the claim. And what do I mean by evidence? I don't mean proofs, you know, sort of mathematical evidence necessarily. Sometimes, um, it, so it might be a theorem, that's kind of nice in, in some ways, but then you know when you've done it, but it might also be analysis and comparisons, measurements, case studies, more sort of soft things, but nevertheless, some reason, what's evidence? It's a reason for the reader to believe that you've achieved your goal and to be able to reproduce your goal, to say, I've got the idea, I can see how the idea works, I could reproduce it myself. Right? That's, that's, and it's, um, <clears throat> and uh, you want to go back and check your claims. Okay? Um, so, in fact, you see, that's, that, I'm not really saying any more about this, because this is the part of the paper, if not easy to write, we all understand how to do it. We've just got to write down the details of the, of the stuff. It's this sort of bit at the beginning and end that I think is important. Okay? But before, before leaving the context, I do want to say a little bit more about related work at the end, and that's this, right? If you read related work sections, they often take the form of, well, there was, uh, you know, um, Green and White uh, had, this, had this paper about this, but they were complete idiots. Their, their system didn't work at all well compared with ours, which is brilliant. And then, oh, and then there was Brown and, 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 and Douglas, and they did this, and that wasn't any good either. Our system is way better. Right? So the, the, the implication is that in order to make my system look good or my solution look good, I have to make them look bad. Right? But this is not true. Credit is like love. It's, uh, if, if, I give you, if I have £10 and I give you £5, I only have £5 left. Credit is not like that. If I have love and I give you love, do I have less love? No. Love is an infinitely divisible commodity. That's what's so great about it. And credit is like is the same. If I give you credit for a paper, if I say, what, what, what's your name, Mark, Maxim? Max, Max. If I say, in Max's um, fascinating paper of 19, you know, 2008, uh, you know, he, he does the following thing, then just by saying fascinating paper, you know, I've given some credit to Max for what he's done and acknowledged the truth, which is that I've stood on his shoulders in doing my work. All right? So any paper that you, have, you really have found inspiring or interesting, put, just put in an adjective to be nice to the authors. It's actually true. And it makes them feel good. And the world is a better place as a result. But does that make sense? And, and it doesn't diminish you. It doesn't mean that people will think your paper is worse because uh, you've been nice about other people. Right? Um, <clears throat> The other half of um, uh, the, the sort of related work stuff is that sometimes you, uh, you have the feeling that the authors feel compelled to show that their work is better than everybody else's in every dimension, you know, in the x direction, in the y direction, in the z direction, in the time direction, everything is better. And this is seldom the case, right? Usually, uh, your approach is kind of better along some axes and perhaps not so good on others. And it's good science to mention the ones which it's not so good at. It's also good tactics, because if your reviewers are the ones who point that out, they said, 
the reader does no, sorry, the author does not appear to be aware that his system absolutely sucks when it comes to X, Y, or Z. That's not a good thing to have in your review. Whereas you, if you point out, you say, in the X, Y, and Z applications, you know, probably not a good idea to use our approach because you know, it, it, it actually blogs this system will work better here. That's fine. That's good science. So, um, yeah. So is it better to have uh, this uh, acknowledging your weaknesses all in one place in the related work, or uh, does it make sense to acknowledge them in the sections where they might come up? It's, uh, I, so I would, in general, I think the easiest place to describe weaknesses is in the related work section when you are making comparisons, because then you are in the business of comparing, right? Earlier, you might, you, it, it may well make sense to say in some earlier, more, uh, you know, more, more detailed section, you may say, well, you know, this, this, neat, this is a neat way of solving problem X. You, know, you may note that it doesn't solve problem Y. You, you might, that, that might be a natural thing to say um, if, if, it, if it kind of seems, seems obvious. But in some ways, it can be hard to do that kind of stuff as you're going along because you haven't yet described the full sort of glory and roundness of what you're, what you're trying to do. By the time you've got to the end, you have so much more terminology and common context with your reader. By the time they get to the related work, they will understand uh, a lot more easily the things you're trying to say by way of uh, evaluation and judgments than as they go along. So I didn't plan to put it at the end. Anyone else about this? OK. Uh, are you standing up in a kind of hopeful kind no, of way? No, no, no. I just thought if there are more questions now, I right. will kind of... Or you can run around with mic microphones, yes, yes. So they're coming so come to the recording. Let me just mention the inverse thing, which is just as acknowledging, not acknowledging weaknesses is at least poor tactics, not acknowledging important related work is a death knell, right? So, uh, and, and rightly so, if a reviewer finds himself or herself writing in your review, the author does not appear to be aware that... System, you know, uh, this paper from two years ago does essentially the same thing as theirs, or covers 80% of what's in this paper, or is highly relevant but is completely unmentioned. That's really, really, really not good. Right? So you must acknowledge other people, um, and it's not. Again, it's because it, it's true. Right? They did. Uh, had some stuff, you probably read their paper, if you didn't, you should. I mean, of course, it might be that you genuinely uh, don't know about it, and that would be bad, but you, not much you can do about that. But this part is not good, right? So if you, leave, if you leave out something you do know about, because you hope that the referees don't know about it either. Bad, bad tactic. Bad science and bad tactic as well. Uh, quick thing about conclusions. Uh, don't have very long conclusions. Uh, sometimes you say, people say, uh, tell them what you're going to say, then say it, and then summarize, and summarize the story at the end. By the time people get to the end of the research paper, my experience is they're a bit tired, and they don't read the conclusions. But your column inches, going back to your question about length, are often very constrained. So uh, I, I tend to finish with a section not called, I tend not to have further work and then conclusions. I tend to have a section called conclusions and further work, and then I sort of, as it were, sketch things that I you know, might do in the future. And I wouldn't spend too much time on further work, but sometimes you find people have a long section on further work, which is kind of like, reads like a research grant proposal that says, here are lots of things that I would like to do, but I haven't done yet. And again, your readers are not terribly interested in that. They want to know stuff that you have done that they can use. OK? Yeah. yeah. Oh, several of you. No, no you, 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 were, you were first here. Yeah. Um, oh, thank you. Nansu. Yeah. Right. So in our recent journal paper, we are just criticized that uh, we shouldn't put the what we're going to do in the future work because this is the uh, the reviewers somehow consider that it will constrain other people's oh. mind to some certain topic that we are going to do. Oh, you mean you, you sort of planted your flag and said we're going to do that, and so you mustn't. Uh, I mean, the, the reviewers' suggestion is somehow like they su that suggested that we point out some of the weak problem or some open problem uh -huh. that may be solved by other people. Right, that so, seems reasonable. So further, it might be further work that we are going to do and nobody else must. Just here's further work that's suggested by this research. You know, go to it, audience. <laughs> so I, I've never had that, that kind of comment myself. Mm -hmm. But I think the, an, an easy way to deal with it is just to keep, keep the further work section short. Uh -huh. right? Not to say too much, not to take too many column inches on that. Okay. Uh, because it's not part of the real payload of the paper. It's more like saying, uh, it's obvious that you know, we haven't finished here, there's lots of interesting avenues, and you, the reader, may like to take some of them up. That's the message you'd like to convey. Mm -hmm. Success is so infecting your readers that they join you in the research program. 
That's success. You, you had a question? Yeah, I know. Right. Um, I'm sort of ambiguous on the question where to put limit, um, limitations of the method. So oh. uh, one approach uh, that I can imagine is to put it directly where they belong in the technical uh, section. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. if, I, if I'm describing a problem, I also have to describe as a limitation of, mm -hmm. of the approach mm -hmm. I, I took. Uh, the other thing is that, well, put it to the conclusions and future work because it's sort of good way to have it there because if somebody is just uh, scanning through the paper, well, he will see it there, he will see the utility or Mm -hmm. Non-utility to it. This is about lim limitations. Well, it's kind of what uh, what I was saying in response to your colleague at the back here. I would oh. I'd be inclined to, because where we're talking about uh, weaknesses, that, that means limitations, right? Things that you don't do so well. Mostly, I find myself putting that in related work, or maybe if it comes up earlier, I seldom put in the conclusions because I'm trying to keep the conclusions short. Because no, I'm but I mean, really putting it in the, in the technical section. Yep, that's fine too. If it comes up naturally there, go for it. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. what I mean. It's, the only reason not to put it there is if it's hard to understand the limitation when you haven't read the next technical section. True, but true. That's all, yeah. So I saw quite many conclusion sections that were essentially copies of the respective abstract sections, but with the tense changed from yeah. uh, present to past. What exactly. What do you think about that? Uh, well, so do you think that's a good use of column inches? No. No, total waste of paper, right? So that's why I think the, you know, tell them what you're going to do, tell them, and then, and then reproduce the abstract in the conclusion. No help at all. I just leave it out, you know, just say, summarize briefly, briefly. Yeah. My question is about a special kind of papers like tool papers. I mean, when you write a tool and you are in a race with other tools, mm -hmm. you have to a little bit uh, offending about other tools like, yeah, you, you, you couldn't find that bug with your tool, but I can find it right now. I don't think you need to be offending, right? You can say, in the outstanding SAT solver designed by so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, which, you know, which has many fantastic properties, uh, you know, it, 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 it's clever in this way, and it, but here's the table that shows our, our performance. And um, you know, as you can see, uh, we do actually succeed in outperforming them quite often, right? So the, the data speaks for itself. You don't need to say, in the very stupid SAT solver these guys have written. <laughs> in other words, you can be nice about their work, because it almost certainly is good work, while still presenting data that shows that you uh, 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 improve them on some axes. So I, would, I would try to do that if you can. That's the, the flavor of the message, I think, that's good. Any more questions? Yeah, one, one more back here, and then we'll, we've got to stop at lunchtime, haven't we? Um, my question is about the details. How, how deep to describe my system if it's kind of complicated? I mean, one, one, on one hand, I can go on, on all the details. Uh -huh. On the other hand, I can be like, get like more over the overview, but like, what's the balance? Oh, well, so how, how, how detailed can you be? It's hard for me to answer that because pretty much it's constrained by the paper, right? Um, by the length of the paper. Um, you just don't have much space, right? The, the only thing I'd say is try to focus on your key idea. Put the details that articulate your idea, and if there are other kind of only lo loosely related stuff, but that's important to you, write another paper. I don't know if I can say any more than that, really. Uh, yes, at the back corner. Uh, how do you do appendix? I see paper with 10 pages, uh, of 10 paper and 15 pages of appendix. Yeah, so appendix, appendices for papers are a bit like technical reports. They say, you know, we proved this theorem, and if you want to see the proof, here it is. So that's really good because it doesn't drag the reader through the proof. It says, here is where you can find the evidence if you want it. Or it might even be in, you know, online somewhere. I think, I think that's good. Try not to put, what you want to do is you want to put material that um, clearly is a kind of subroutine call away. You get the payload from the theorem uh, and, then, and they can go and find it if they want. That kind of thing. Supporting data. Good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we've got, we got, we got to stop for lunch too. We? Yeah. Okay, so one, one question. Sometimes you're in between fields or yeah. you have a really complicated issue and you, you somehow need a gentle introduction to that, mm -hmm. a longer introduction. Where do you put that? Uh, um, so I, that, that, that's writing cross field papers and papers about complicated ideas is simply harder. Uh, so, you know, sometimes that means you have to aim at a journal because conferences are often narrowly focused and sometimes are not very hospitable to cross-field papers. And if you need more, more space, you may, you may just need to say, you know, perhaps this is a, you know, almost semi-tutorial or survey paper sometimes. I, I don't quite know 
I'm not sure I can any, say anything very meaningful in response to your question, except to acknowledge that, yes, it's harder. And so if you, the more initially, particularly in the early stages of a search career, the more you can focus on you know, more single issue, issue politics, if you like, the easier you'll make, make your life. Um, and then you can sort of try more am, am, ambitious and, and difficult, but still important. I'm not saying it's not important. It's usually important to do this cross-field stuff. It's just harder. And how to choose uh, section titles? Should I follow it like tradition, like introduction uh, and problem statement, experimental settings and evaluation like this, or should I be more creative? I would be, I would be creative, yeah. Like, uh, you know, read ones that you, write section headings that you'd like to read. So yeah. can I choose from my contribution list? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Okay. Yeah, just write the ones that you'd like to read. Write the ones that make sense. Don't worry about some abstract skeleton. Okay. Go for it. So we're going okay. to stop and have lunch. Hang on, just, yeah. uh, just, just, just one moment. Yeah. I, want to, I want to say, uh, what, do I, what do I, I want to say? Uh, those, these slides will all be available somewhere. Yes, Scarlett yes, will tell you where, right? Well. Yep. Yeah. Um, so there's a, bunch of, um, uh, there's, a there's a bunch of further slides that I'm clearly not going to talk about now because we're going to have lunch about the actual sort of process of getting about writing. And I want to say one thing about this before we go to have lunch, which is to get, your, get friends to read your paper. Right? Get them to act as guinea pigs. And if you give, to give your paper to a friend to read, right, so I give it to Alexander to read, what Alexander will naturally do is he'll give it back to me covered with suggestions about spelling mistakes and grammatical infelicities. Because he will read it and he'll get lost in section three, but he'll be much too polite to say that, right? right? You'll just say, oh, this sentence construction is not very good. But what you want him to say is, I got lost in section three, right here. Because that's your, remember, you're carrying your readers on a journey. So you have to educate your readers about what you want them to do. So try to sit in front of them and say, don't tell me about spelling mistakes. Don't tell me about grammar, grammar. Tell me where you got lost. And then, then you can have a dialogue with them, right? You, they read the paper. They say, I got lost here. And you say, oh, uh, let's see if we can unpack this. So you start whiteboard stuff. And they say, oh, now I understand. Often what happens is all, they, all you need to do is they say, well, I got lost. You say, you explain it. They say, that's great. And all you have to do is record what you said in that conversation and write it down in the paper. It's incredible how much better people are explaining something verbally than they are. Um, so there's a really good guinea pig thing. And the rest of the, the slides, which is a bit, bit more about um, uh, reviewing uh, stuff and about um, uh, sort of language and so forth, you can read um, online or look at a video or something. But we should stop for lunch, right, because it's... Uh, yeah, it's up to lunch time. Uh, uh, did I want to? Did, is it, was just, just let me see if there was anything else that I just wanted to say about um, uh, so about this thing. We have, we have two hours oh, that's right. We have two hours to lunch. But but but, but you're going to you're going to get hungry and then you'll stop paying attention. That's not good. <laughs> so um, let me let me just see briefly if there's um, uh, one or one or one or two things I wanted to add from you about experts. So non-expert guinea pigs are good. Expert guinea pigs are also good. And I want to give you one idea for how to get experts to read your paper. When you write your related work section, you'll mention various other people, right? If you send your paper to them saying, Dear Professor Sniggins, I was found your paper so inspiring, and it better be true, right? I enjoyed your paper, and I've did some, done some work that, that you know, uh, builds on it in, in, in what I think was an interesting way. And, I, and I'm just enclosing a drafting, but, but in the related work section, I say something about your paper, and I'd just like to check that, I'm, that I express it in a fair way, right? At that point, <laughs> Professor Sniggins thinks, Whoo! Ha! Ah, He's writing about my paper. Uh, I'll just have a quick look, right? So he looks at the related work section, and then he, th he can't resist it. He looks back a bit, right? And, and soon, soon he's, he's reading a bit more. Now, he still may not send you any feedback, but it's not a bad plan, particularly as he may be one of your reviewers, because what conference program chairs do is they say, who's in the citation? So they'd be plausible reviewers, right? So if you can get him to slag you off now, right, while it's in draft, that's way better than when he's being the reviewer. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> very tactical. <laughs> I see. You mean, so if you send it to too many people, then none of them will be able to review it, and you'll be left with only people who, who uh, are completely non-experts. All right, good, good, good point. You, you may not want to. In fact, it's hard to do this because you're writing against the deadline, and you never have it ready in time. You probably are going to use this technique rather spelling. Uh, the last thing I want to say was about reviews. After your paper is rejected, which it will be, our paper is rejected all the time, you will get reviews that seem to you, at the moment you receive them, to be blatantly unfair. Right? You will be bleeding 
all right, because your precious work, which you've invested so much in, has been rejected. Put the review aside, wait a week, and then come back to it with a, perhaps a greater sense of perspective, and look at the review and try to think, how could I rewrite this paper <coughs> so that not even the world's most stupid reviewer could make that mistake? Right? How could I rewrite the paper so that not even a very stupid reviewer could make that mistake? Now, of course, sometimes reviewers are literally incompetent, and there's nothing you can do about that. It's just tough. Sometimes happens. But more often, they are well-meaning and expert, but they misunderstood. And that is something you can fix. Right? So just don't ignore, don't, don't just bleed from the reviews. Try to profit from them, however hard it is. It's time. Excellent. Thank you very Great. much. Great. 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 Great.